You can always tell it's an episode that I really enjoy when I go through it and I actually get, no joke, goosebumps at certain scenes. Seriously, like, it's on the arm, just chills. Oh, I love this. Which is doubly funny because this was originally supposed to be a clip show. The They were a little over budget because, well, they'd gone over budget for season four, and the studio basically basically said, yep, yeah, pull it back. And they pulled it back under a quarter of a grant or a quarter of a million, which may not sound like a lot, but that's pretty cheap for an episode of television, uh, especially one that is pushing the kind of effects that Star Trek usually does, science fiction television, and indeed science fiction anything, generally being more expensive than other types of productions. So they somehow managed to slide this one under the budget. Now, <laughs> you guys know that I have a bit of a thing against Rick Berman, and I'm not really apologetic for that because that is my legitimate opinion. However, I always like to point out when he does both good and bad because I think we should get a more clear picture of a larger scale rather than just assuming that he's all evil or all good, to wit. When the studio said, we need to make this a clip show, it was Rick Berman and Michael Piller who both went to bat for this and said, no, no, clip shows are awful. They're terrible. They're just going to hurt the the consumer trust. The audience isn't going to like them. We don't like making them, please. And credit where credit is due... He went to bat for this episode being made instead of a clip show. And keep in mind, they had five guest stars on this episode. Now, two of those guest stars had to basically agree to come on for extremely small amounts of money, including Sean Simmons, who ended up playing Admiral Satie. And one of those guest stars had no speaking lines, so he, he was actually billed. Even though he was a guest star, he was actually billed as an extra. Nevertheless, they still managed to make this work as a, basically the definition of a bottle show. And as an aside, I find it funny how many bottle shows or episodes I really enjoy in Star Trek. Anyways, so credit where credit is due. This is also a very continuity-heavy episode. At least part of that has to stand on the strength of the fact that the original core idea came from Ronald D. Moore, who was really big on continuity, and the actual script was done by Jerry Taylor. Once again, making my point like I just made, of giving credit where credit is due. As I've said before, Jerry Taylor is not actually a terrible writer. I disagreed with a lot of what she did over on Voyager, but most of that was her as a producer, not as a writer. In fact, I I tend to picture the same way about several characters or several uh, uh, creators. So this was written by Jerry Taylor, guys, (laughs) based on ideas by Ronald D. Moore and directed by Jonathan Frakes. Excellent directing, excellent script, very powerful, very meaningful. Practically a timeless episode, no less. Now, that being stated, this epi- there's one other thing I have to talk about before I actually really get into the episode. And that's the fact that uh, this is the last Ron Jones episode. Now, I'm going to pause and actually talk about music for a bit, so if you want to skip ahead a few minutes to get to the episode, I'm just warning you, I'm going to talk about the music of Star Trek for a few minutes, because this is the moment. This is it. This is when the wallpaper... Actually, to be slightly more accurate, next episode is when the wallpaper era of Star Trek began for with regards to its music. Now, I've made my opinion on this very clear. I disagree with Rick Berman on this one, but also Rick, it wasn't just Rick Berman, it was also Peter Lauritsen. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I've never actually heard it stated out loud, so I'm not actually sure if I am saying his name accurately here. <sighs> just kind of looking at the name here really quick, trying to make sure that I'm not screwing it up. Because it just, yeah, it just says Lauritsen. There's no guide there. Whatever. I actually have a decent amount of respect for Peter Lauritsen um, in general. You've probably never heard of the name, and I don't blame you for that. You've heard of Rick Berman. You've heard of Michael Piller. You know, frontliners. But Peter uh, Lauritsen is a post-production producer. He's a guy who helps manage and take care of stuff and making sure everything is cohesive after the footage has already been filmed in general. And he's also a one of the very, very few people who was with Star Trek for the entirety of this particular era. He signed on with TNG, and he left with Enterprise. And there's not a lot of people who can say that. That being said, Lauritsen apparently had... And I, okay, hang on, actually, before I go any further, I have to say, there's a lot of disagreeing information on exactly what happened. We know there was a disagreement, we know there was an argument on the creation of this episode in specific, and we know that uh, Ron Jones stopped working here. And I say that very specifically because we're not even sure if he was fired, laid off, or, or he quit. 
something happened and Ron Jones ended up no longer working on Star Trek as a consequence of this. And again, we don't know the specifics of that actual incident. We know that there's an argument about this episode between Peter Lauritsen and Ron Jones. Lauritsen went to uh, Berman. Berman sided with Lauritsen, and then Jones left or was fired. This is, these are the facts we have. You can infer whatever you want from this. Since then, Ron Jones has commented on this and basically said that, you know, the, the show's music is crap from now on, and I agree with him on that. Uh, I believe I myself brought up the idea of how many DS9 musics can you remember off the top of your head as being memorable. Now, some of you actually responded to that, which is great. I, I don't even remember the ones you guys brought up. I still, to this very day, cannot think of any DS9 music that's memorable outside of the, the title crawl, the, the two or three versions of the title crawl. But that's my opinion. I'm with Jones on this one. I think the wallpaper music thing is bad. And then, of course, Rick Berman has since gone on to say that Ron Jones was just being, you know, an artist who was too persnickety and wanted too much credit and wanted to be part of the main program and blah, blah, blah. Basically bashing him the way Ron Jones bashes him. There was obviously some conf conflict here, is all I'm trying to say. That being said, I'm more willing to take Jones's side than Berman's. Not because I like Jones or dislike Berman, because I do dislike Berman, but specifically because Rick Berman has a pattern, and, and I'll talk about this later when it comes to DS9 and Jadzia Dax, as well as I've already talked about this when it comes to Wesley Crusher on this show. Rick Berman has a pattern of basically flagrantly lying to slam someone after the fact basically to make it look like it was all the actor's fault or all the writer's fault or, or all Ron Jones's fault for leaving when basically every other account disagrees. Now, we don't have the other account thing here. When it comes to Will Wheaton, when it comes to Terry Farrell, we have many other uh, witness accounts that's, that basically side with the actor in those cases. We don't have that with Ron Jones, but you can see why I'm more inclined to say that this was Berman and, and Lawrence and basically saying, get the hell out and forcing him out of the show because they disagreed with him or whatever, and slamming him after the fact. Don't know if that's true, but I do want to talk about the music thing in addendum to this really quick, because I want to give a fair shake to both perspectives. I do. Just because I agree with a side doesn't mean the other side is invalid or wrong. See, Berman's overall approach, and he has talked about this several times in multiple interviews, he believes that the music is something that you expect to be there, in other words, if the music was wrong, or excuse me, if the music was absent, it would be wrong. Now, he's right about that. Um, there's a reason I have the concept, the no music concept, and why when we play Kingdom Hearts games, I have a no music counter. Because no music doesn't mean the absence of music. No music means a scene which feels off or unusual due to the absence of music. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, there's been many, many, many studies done this over the years. Any, all you have to do is look up any, anything where it's a game or a show or a book where the music's turned off. It just feels off, right? I know you know what I'm talking about. So the music should be there. But it is his belief that the music should not be a part of the action. It should not be a part of the narrative. The music should be there because it should be there and for no other reason. There's no reason to spend the extra time and money on trying to make it good. Okay. Again, there is a validity to that perspective. The idea that music shouldn't be a part of it is a matter of opinion, and the fact that making the music a part of it costs more is a matter of fact. The other side of the perspective on that one is that the music should be a part of the narrative. Uh, in other words, that the music should not just be good music, but more to the point, should specifically elevate a specific scene. Now, there's actually a scene in this episode I'm going to point out to, that does that, but let me give you a slightly more famous example. How many of you guys have seen Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope? Statistically speaking, I'm betting 100% of you have. <laughs> Watch, I'm going to get like five comments. I've never seen it. Okay, 99.9 .9 repeating percent of you have probably seen Star Wars, A New Hope. I'm going to point to a specific scene, though, because it's not one of the bigger scenes. It's when Obi-Wan Kenobi first shows up, and... There's this bit where he's, he's there, and we, R2 sees him, and R2's worried. And then he says, don't be frightened. Come here, little one. He looks, he's going to be okay. And then Luke gets up and says, Ben! Ah, oh, hey, I was looking for Obi-Wan Kenobi. And then the music does this little, da-da-da, da-da-da, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Da-da-da, da-da-da, Obi-Wan. 
That's not a name I've heard in a long time. And as he begins this speech, a horn starts playing in the background. You probably, I have a pretty good audio memory, but I imagine most of you, despite me pulling a specific scene out of a movie you may not have seen in years, can still tell what I'm referring to. That music was built for the scene. That, that's what John Williams is so brilliant at, in my opinion, personally. He manages to make music that specifically adds to, elevates, and, and basically adds additional layers and dimensions to the, an already existing scene. That's why John Williams is such a great movie composer. And that, the, that is basically the other side of the argument in a nutshell. That scene with generic wallpaper music would have been cheaper. That is absolutely true. It would have been cheaper to produce and easier to produce. But it would have lacked the same kind of impact because the music then would just be there because you expect music to be there. Imagine it's like Obi-Wan Kenobi, huh? And you just hear just a generic... Da, 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 in the background, just like a light strings piece or whatever. It would not have felt the same. Which side of this argument you side on is up to you, but I want to add one last thing before I move on to the episode proper, and that's that I in no way made any insult towards Jay Chataway. Now, I know I've brought him up before when it comes to ruminations, and I've mentioned him on Discord and on streams. Jay Chataway is basically the Star Trek composer. If you have watched TNG, Season 5 and onwards, DS9, Voyager, or Enterprise, you've heard Jay Chataway. He, he is the mainline uh, composer for that entire era of Star Trek. He's the guy who does the generic wallpaper music. I brought it up in basics, even, over on Voyager. Now, I bring this up because he's not a bad composer. I've heard his works. He's just a composer who is willing to do what the boss tells him to do. So he made generic wallpaper music. <laughs> so I, I intend no insult towards Jay Chataway whatsoever. Side, side note, while we're here, how many of you guys know who Seth MacFarlane is? Now, for those of you who don't, on the off chance, Seth MacFarlane is someone I don't find funny. I don't enjoy his sense of humor, but I like the person a lot. He's a geek. He's a huge geek who is also the kind of person who really wants to do stuff because it's the right thing to do or because it's the creative thing to do. You know, he, he basically b uh, bankrolled excuse me, uh, the new Cosmos show basically because, oh my God, yes, of course, let's make a new Cosmos show, right? He made his own Star Trek show because he had always wanted to make his own Star Trek show. I mean, that's, he, he has used a lot of his fame and money and influence in order to basically pursue passion projects. And I usually have a lot of respect and, and for someone who has that kind of legitimate passion for the creative process. And Seth MacFarlane is a huge Star Trek geek. Why am I bringing him up? When Seth MacFarlane was, was basically beginning what would, what would become the meteoric rise of his, uh, his stardom when it comes to Hollywood, making a weird kind of sitcom -y cartoon show called Family Guy, he personally approached Ron Jones and said, hey, and specifically asked Jones to be his composer. Why? Because MacFarlane was a huge Star Trek geek and loved Ron Jones' work on TNG. To this day, Ron Jones does music for Far McFarlane in basically whatever he does. Uh, most notably, of course, Family Guy. He also did American Dad, you know, stuff like that. I just thought I'd point that out because I, I, I kind of enjoy the fact that someone looked at Ron Jones and said, that man is talented, I'm hiring the crap out of him. Because that's exactly what I would want to do, right? Like, I, I look at these talented people and I'm like, oh my god, you're really good at such and such. Crab! Here, here's a job! <laughs> and that's exactly what McFarlane did. Excuse me. So, uh, okay, so let's get to the episode proper. Whew. Right at the beginning, we see the idea of the attempted bribe. Now, I like this scene for two reasons. First of all, this is actually contiguous. That is to say, it's a part of continuity. We've already seen the Romulans be an issue as, a, as recently as Season 3. And, or, excuse me, that's the wrong way to phrase it. Ever since Season 3, and we also know that you know, coming up there's the Redemption story arc. So the Romulan-Klingon stuff has slowly been building, and this is yet another piece. We see that there is a Klingon agent who is gaining information on the Federation for the Romulans. I only point this out because this is, once again, another excellent example of background continuity, or setting continuity, the kind of stuff that TNG is really good at. And I only point it out because almost no one does. Like, of all the points people point out when it comes to the Romulan Klingon story arc, no one ever brings up the drumhead. I always find that weird. We also see, once again, the idea of 
Klingon politics and external honor. Now, I've talked about that many times in other episodes, especially over DS9, so I'm not going to recover that here. I just find it funny that Worf finds it insulting to think that he would accept this bribe in exchange for fake honor. <laughs> because he's Worf. Now... <laughs> Uh, right early on, there's a bit where, um, I, I don't know if I've given praise, but I want to give praise again to Jean, uh, Jean Simmons. I hope I'm saying her name right, because sometimes some people say Jean Simmons, and some people say John Simmons. I, I don't know which is preferred. Miss Simmons does an excellent job as Admiral Satie. She's a, an older actress, but one who is very prolific. She manages the slow descent perfectly, but we'll talk more about that later. They mentioned she was the one who was involved with revealing the conspiracy in the episode uh, Conspiracy with the Bluegills. That's the weirdest bit of continuity I've ever seen because we did that. Like Picard and Riker personally did that. Took out the Queen in Commander Hendrick, right? I mean, <laughs> how was she involved in that incident? And I looked it up in case there was just some other conspiracy going on at the exact same time. No, that was intended to be referencing the events of conspiracy. In fact, the events of conspiracy, Sins of the Father, all the Borg stuff and Data's Day are all referenced in this episode. Because again, heavy continuity. I don't know. So they show off the explosion. I am astonished no one was injured by that. And you know, there's a few scenes as things are deduced and things are picked out. I like the idea of the proteins being used as a method of conveying information. As is mentioned, he could just in inject someone and that person is now an unwilling carrier for the information. And they mention that one person that he had injected, or excuse me, we presume he injected, has basically gone missing because that person was then picked up after having been flagged and, you know, taken in for resequencing and then probably killed because, you know, Romulans, right? Fun stuff, fun stuff. I also like how Worf pushes Jadan, or Jadan, I forget how they pronounce it. I point this out because, how many of you have seen the DS9 episode, Rules of Engagement? Now, I've seen that recently because I've already covered it. But in that episode, the uh, Worf is on trial by another Klingon. And the other Klingon basically wins his case by proving Worf wrong by pushing him. And, the, and Worf, being a Klingon, just like Jadan is a Klingon, can't help but just, you know, bite back. Because... It's so ingrained into Klingon culture that how you react determines so much of social interaction, right? I've talked about this several times before. So you provoke a Klingon, and they'll give something away because they have to. Otherwise, they're seen as weak or whatever. Oh, right, it was a trap. It's, a, it's kind of funny because it kind of shows how this type of judicial hearing is the sort of thing a Klingon is super not suited for. So then Jadon is like, ah, 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 there's, there's no... You're horrible and awful, and I will destroy you. The, Kle oh, the blood of all Klingons has become as water. The Romulans are strong. Sure. <laughs> Whatever you want to think there, buddy. There is a nice little tidbit, though. How did he get on board the Enterprise without external help? Remember that for later. Again, quiet continuity right there in the background. Now... There's this bit where I praise Miss Simmons mostly because she comes across as warm, cooperative, and polite for over half the episode. She is nice. She is intelligent. She at no point in time comes across as arrogant or bullish or, you know, all of the usual traits we would normally associate with a villainous character especially in a TV show and especially in Star Trek. How many times... Have, you know what I'm talking about. They're just, they're just a dick, right? They're just kind of abrasive or, or pushy or they're the character you're supposed to hate because by the rules of television, those kind of characters then get their comeuppances to make the audience feel good, right? Very typical rules that are usually followed, again, even in Star Trek. You, know, you just have to look at the obstructionist bureaucrat archetype of character, which is throughout all of Star Trek, to see what I'm talking about. Even in Enterprise, they would use that same archetype, usually with regards to the Vulcans, but nevertheless. So, her presentation adds so much to it, because she comes across as the opposite of that. She's warm, caring, understanding. She praises Worf. She says, oh, no, Captain, I, would, I, I have to admit, honestly and openly, I resented being assigned to you, but I now see I was wrong. 
You have proven to be a true ally and partner in this, and I'm glad to have you at my side. There's just such a genuineness to that. It adds so much to her character and what eventually becomes of her. And I'll talk about that, of course, when we get there. Pardon me one moment. Please forgive me, I am still recovering, as you can see. Now, there's a scene which happens, which I might actually comment on later, because I think it's more relevant later. So then we bring in Tarsus. Now, Tarsus is nervous, uneasy, and just, oh God, oh God, oh God. And it's all over his face and his body language. Now, I like that. Now, obviously, Tarsus does have something to hide. And his career has basically been torpedoed as a consequence of this episode. Thing is, I, I like the nervousness because a lot of people get nervous under these circumstances. I, I think Babylon 5 put it best, but I don't remember the exact quote. You know, the, the, the guilty run because they're guilty, the innocent run because they're afraid of being, you know, being in, inaccurately labeled as guilty or something like that. He says, it, uh, he says it so much more eloquently than I do. But it gets across the same idea. Of course he's nervous. He's been brought before an informal inquiry with an admiral and his captain, his personal captain, and they're both asking him questions about some kind of thing, and there's like a, a guard and everything. Of course he's nervous. I would be nervous, and I wouldn't have anything to hide. And Tarsus does have something to hide. Just one thing. But he does have something to hide. And it's totally unrelated to anything. But you could still feel that fear. Oh, God, what could this be about? Right? Now, this then gets, this is when things start to shift perspective a little bit, because she insists on pursuing this matter because her aide, uh, Sabin, I think is how they pronounce it, I, I keep wanting to say Sabin, but I'm pretty sure, it's, no, it's Sabine? The, the Betazoid, I think it's Sabin, the Betazoid uh, detected that he was specifically lying. Okay, I find myself wondering if telepathic readings is admissible in courts in the Federation, because the legal side of that has never really been explored. Anyways, <clears throat> you'd think it would be at least established since telepaths exist in common parlance, but I'm getting off topic. So she says that is sufficient evidence and reason to pursue the matter further. Now, put it to you this way. In real life, if a cop says, I think they did this, that is sufficient reason for a further investigation. Now, if they're proven wrong, well, then nothing happens. But if they're proven right, then, you know, there you go. Um, I, can, I can never remember the exact legal term for that because I'm an idiot. But, the, you know, that, there's a... It's something about sus suspicion, reasonable suspicion, or something like that. That's, that's, you don't have to do much, is what I'm to say, in real-life legal matters in order to justify an investigation. I point that out because I think a Betazoid saying he's lying is basically the legal equivalent of a cop saying, I think he did such and such, right? Ergo, it's interesting because Picard finds this objectionable. Picard says, hang on, hang on, hang on. You're, you're going to go over this just over his, his testimony? And she says, well, yeah, of course I am. And what I like best about her counter-argument is she basically slams him with continuity. How many times have you done something on the advice of your Betazoid counselor? And, he, and, and I love that his counter-argument is to basically say, well, you know, of course she's a Betazoid counselor. That's her job. And, and so, in other words, completely avoiding the argument, and Satie smashes him right back in the middle of it. No. How many times have you used her when dealing with aliens or enemy forces or whatever? And Picard's like... <sighs> and he has to concede that he has used Troy... I shouldn't say use, that's the wrong word, but... Yeah. He has employed Troy in the same manner that Satie has employed Sab Sabin. It's it just shows the level of deductive capacity and, and debating that she is capable of. She mentions a story about how, as kids, her father would have them around the table, with the frickin' stopwatch, to be able to learn how to be concise with their arguments and how to debate an issue back and forth. Now, I have to admit that actually sounds fascinating to me because I love debates, but. That also sounds horrible because it was basically forced on both children. And based on very minor inferences, we get the idea that the brother involved didn't like that and didn't go into this, whereas she, she embraced it. And this also establishes a thread early on, her, for lack of a better way to put it, hero worship of her own father. 
We'll bring that up later. Now, I'm looking at my notes. So, finally, Picard has to admit, okay, okay, you obviously have a point here. And then Worf and Sabin both insist we need to look into this. You know, no sabotage. Because what happens next is they find out there was no sabotage. The Warp Core thing was a freak accident. That's it. That's all. Well, we did catch a spy. And she says a line in this line right here. <laughs> Just because there's no sabotage doesn't mean there is no conspiracy on this vessel. That line. <laughs> so... Picard argues you cannot treat a man as guilty until innocent. He is innocent until proven guilty. I don't want to get into too much controversial stuff. All I'm going to say is that the innocent until proven guilty is a nice little lie in real life. Because too often it is guilty until proven innocent. That is the most common approach, even in non-legal matters. If you suspect someone of something, you tend to automatically assume they are guilty and then may prove their innocence, rather than automatically assume they're innocent and then prove them guilty. Am I right? So, <laughs> I like that the way Picard stands on that, because Picard, for all of his many flaws, is a very morally centered individual, someone who basically has principles that he believes are sacrosanct. You know, we've talked before about this concept, especially when it comes to Janeway over on Voyager, because they tried to write her as a, as a second Picard in many ways. And this is where that, a lot of that comes from. Picard is someone who looks at this and says, no, wham, this is correct, because this is what I believe to be correct. This is what I have, have dedicated my career and my life to. This is the idea that we must treat this man as innocent until proven guilty. And notice Satie's counter-argument. Once again, she shows her capacity for debating by saying, of course, Thus, we must prove his innocence. We must verify that he is innocent beyond doubt in, in, in order to, to make sure that he is now able to go home and these allegations are dropped. And that's the tact she uses. She's so reasonable about it. I love it. She's so, she's so quiet about it. And so they decide uh, to go to the next hearing. And the next hearing is an open-door hearing. From this point on, things starts to escalate considerably. If you were to think about this episode on a curve, this is how this episode goes, basically. Because it starts off, everything she says and does is reasonable and reasonable and reasonable, and then it just starts escalating very quickly towards the end of the episode. Because she decides to have an open-door hearing. Her statement as to why, well, she actually gives two reasons. One is a lie, and yet very, a very valid reason to do so. And one is the truth, and not. The lie is she says people don't like it if you hold closed-door hearings for too long. People start to whisper, people start to rumor, think tensions get high, etc. Valid, truthful, but a total lie in this case, because that's not why she's doing it. She is doing that because she is applying pressure to someone she believes is guilty. Guilty until proven innocent. This is also then exemplified when her wonderful Betazoid agent lies blatantly in an official hearing in an attempt to trap him and try to extract additional information from him. Chemical compounds which could have been used. Remember, at this point in time, we've learned exactly what happened with the Warp Core. As it not only wasn't, wasn't a sabotage, it has nothing to do even connected with what he is in, stating outright. This isn't even implication. This is outright fabrication. By the way, what he does is almost certainly legal in many courts here in real life in the modern era, at least here in the States. What, what, the, what Sabin does. The Betazoid. I really hope I'm saying his name right. So, you could see how this approach, this pressure approach, is what she's really after. Because then she lets through a little bit of, let's call it the real Satie. These kind of people, spies and saboteurs, are like cockroaches. They, you don't li they like to skitter away from the bright lights. Yeah. And that's the actual reason why she's doing this. So, then there's an interesting scene. They, they, they lie to him. He, he, he does the equivalent of plead the fifth. I refuse to testify on the grounds that this may inc incriminate me, although that's actually a little bit of a misapplication of the fifth because usually the Fifth Amendment is, is or uh, you know, pleading the fifth, I should say, is usually done to refuse to testify on an unrelated matter because it may incriminate you on an unrelated matter. But whatever, it doesn't matter. Point being, he is advised not to answer. 
which is effectively an admission of guilt. And Worf has a line. Now, I, I actually skipped over this earlier on purpose. Because earlier, Saban approaches Worf. And Saban says, I gotta admi- admit, I, th- I thought of you as a security risk when we first came on, you know, because your, war- your father was someone who was denounced as, you know, in association with the Romulans. Worf says, and I quote, what he did or did not do is no one else's business but my own. Later on, at this point we're at in the episode now, Worf says, if the man were not afraid of the truth, he would answer. Well, now that's interesting, Worf. Why don't you answer about your dad then? And that is brilliant. And credit to Jerry Taylor. That is brilliant connecting right there between those two points. Because anyone can understand the need for privacy. Being private, having something to hide, is not the same as guilt. And I almost feel weird saying that because that's such a duh thing. We all have things to hide. We have a lot of things that we consider private or shy or embarrassing or are just no one else's business, right? We all have our own desire and need for privacy. And yet, when it comes to these kind of matters, matters of accusations, refusal to answer is almost always taken as an admission of guilt. Now, isn't that interesting? In the same circumstances, Worf's refusal to testify, basically, with regards to a question about his dad, could and would have been taken as an admission of guilt by Worf's own statement. And yet we know Worf's dad was actually innocent. He doesn't want to talk about it because it's an extremely personal, very touchy, very painful subject for him. Right? Immediately following this is a scene where Picard goes to Tarsus. And this scene is brilliant. This is Jerry Taylor at her Jerry Taylorist, right here, really. This has her fingerprints all over it. It's just two people talking to each other. And Tarsus is so human. He comes across as so understandable, so relatable. This is just a kid who always wanted to join Starfleet. And he made a mistake. He lied on his report, and he didn't want to go back and and reiterate or or fix it or uh, hear it, and he didn't want to go back and try to attend the academy anymore, even though he could have. He had had the grades. He had the, the drive. He just wanted to get out there. He was in such a rush that he screwed up, and now he's paying for it. That is incredibly human. How many of you have been so eager to do something that you tripped and then you paid for it later? It's a wonderful scene. I'm sorry I don't have much more to say about it. It is a wonderful scene that fleshes him out as a person. This is when things begin to truly escalate. As I said, we kind of logarithmic from this point onwards. Because Picard goes and says, I wish to speak with you off the record. And one of the first things she says is she calls him her partner. Because that's what she said earlier. And, you know, you are, you are my partner. You're in on this together. And he stonewalls her. He says, no. No, I'm not doing this. This is officially wrong. I will do everything in my power to stop you. This is wrong. And he's right. If, I mean, obviously that is a subjective opinion. So, in my opinion, he is right. Doing a witch hunt about this is unnecessary and excessive. This is a man who, like many people, made mistakes. And he is going to pay for it, like many people do. The end. They found the spy. They found a kid who lied on his report. The end. The investigation is over. And yet she pulls authority and rank, which you'll notice she never disclosed to him, by the way. Keep that in mind. Despite the fact that she was so kind and nice and partnery with him earlier, she didn't disclose that she has actually been in direct connection with Starfleet security at the Admiralty level this entire time even though that's the sort of thing that should be disclosed in general, never mind if he was actually with her in this one as a co, I don't know, co-investigator. Then, having revealed his intention to oppose her, Picard, who is very, you know, just, uh, sits down and is served. Notice that he is going to be put on the interrogation block next because he is now the next target The mind of a fanatic, a true fanatic, a true zealot, cannot be described by, I am right and you are wrong. No. 
because that is simply a firm belief in whatever it is you believe in. No, you have to go further. And I'm surprised how well Jerry Taylor gets this across. I shouldn't say that. Again, she does some good character stuff. Because what this is, is a true definition, a true presentation of a fanatic or a zealot. If you are not on my side, totally supporting me and my effort, then you're not just wrong. You are part of the opposition. A true... Obi-Wan kind of a mentality. If you're not with me, then you are my enemy, except taken even a step further than that. You have to support me 100%. You have to embrace me. You have to be fully on my side or I'll screw you. You're the enemy. I've known people like that in real life. And attitudes like that, I swear to God, are at least half the reason pendul pendulum effect, as I call it, actually exists. Quick segue. The reason I say that is because I feel like most people who think a thing, basically, to put this into metaphorical terms, don't push hard enough for the pendulum to swing the other way. It is the very loud, the very extreme, the very demonstrable people who are like, ah, wah, those people who push hard enough to make the pendulum swing the other way. And I think we're seeing a lot of that in real life society, and I think that's a lot of the problems we have in real life society. Unsegue. So Picard is now the next one here at Target site. And the best part is we see this next, too. But I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Because then Picard, who is lawful, we could argue if he's lawful good or lawful neutral. I think he's lawful good, personally. That's just my opinion. Um, but Picard, who can actually quote court regulations to say, no, I actually do have the right to make a speech. Thanks. <laughs> And the way he makes it is brilliant. He basically says, uh, yeah, th this should stop. <laughs> he does it so much more eloquently than I do, of course. He says, this should stop. But what I love most, what I love most is the way he says the word proceeding. Please forgive me. I am deeply concerned about what is happening here. It began when we apprehended a spy, a man who has admitted his guilt and will answer for his crime, but the hunt didn't end there. Another man, Mr. Simon Tarsus, was brought to trial, and it was a trial, no matter what others choose to call it, a trial based on suspicion and innuendo, nothing substantive offered against Mr. Tarsus, much less proven. Mr. Tarsus's grandfather is Romulan, and for that reason his career now stands in ruins. Have we, come, have we become so fearful? Have we become so cowardly that we must extinguish a man because he carries the blood of a current enemy? Admiral, let us not condemn Simon Tarsus or anyone else because of their bloodlines or investigate others for their innocent associations. I implore you, do not continue with this. And he pauses. Proceeding. The way Patrick Stewart says it is brilliant. He practically spits the word out. Proceeding. End it now. Brilliant line. And again, gets across all of his opinion just right there. Bam! They, of course, continue. And the first thing they do is they start to attack his character. <laughs> I've talked about that type of argument before. It's basically, it's actually, I've, there's so many fallacies when it comes to arguing. This is a connected fallacy. There's the fallacy of, I'm not going to establish my point, I'm going to disagree with your point and try to attack your point, putting you on the defensive. It's a very common tactic. There's also the, I'm going to attack your character, to try and make it seem that these unconnecting facts make you seem less reliable of a witness, of a source. Tearing you down, basically, by gr picking at the edges. So they bring up nine violations of the Prime Directive. What I find most interesting about that topic is the fact that he flat out says, yes, and my reports will say everything that needs to be said about them. No hesitation, no shame. Really quick aside, really quick. From TNG onward, that right there is my favorite take of the Prime Directive. That one line in this one scene in an unrelated matter. Because what that implies is that, yes, he violated the Prime Directive, and he justified his reasons for doing so, and those reasons went to command, and then they were approved. He hasn't been stripped of rank. He hasn't been court-martialed. He hasn't been uh, demerited or whatever. That's the Prime Directive I'm with. A baseline which is then built on rather than the hard law which it will later be presented as. Anyways, so then as they're going through this, they talk about the incident in, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the episode all of a sudden, the one where the, the Vulcan woman was actually a Romulan woman, a spy. 
And they basically flat out said, you did nothing to get it back. And Worf is the one who stands up and, and defends him, which is actually a breach of protocol, but let's not get into that. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is still an informal trial, even though the head, the admiral in charge of Starfleet security is sitting right there. Anyways, <clears throat> Worf stands up in defense of him, and rightly so. What Picard did was absolutely correct. He had a choice, pursue the matter or bail. And pursuing the matter would have probably led with either the destruction of the Enterprise or much, much worse. He bailed. It was the correct call. And Worf rightly de de demonstrates that. But this is what I referenced earlier. Picard opposed her, and he was the very next person in, in the, her sights, targeted. Worf defends Picard, and within seconds, the very next thing, you really would think that it's acceptable to have this security agent who is actually the son of a traitor? Whoa! Picard actually has to visibly... Worf, Mr. Worf. Because Worf might have actually just killed the guy on the spot. No joke. Because remember, not only is he acting in a very dishonorable fashion, internal honor, but he's also presuming guilt where no other information exists. Presumed guilty. Remember, you didn't answer the question, so you're presumed guilty. And so Worf is the one targeted in this one, and now implicated in the implication of Picard, branching out the threat. Any, threat. And then, and this is the scene I referenced earlier with the music. Please watch this episode again. It's like the, the second to last scene of the episode when, when this final court hearing happens. Listen to the music when she talks about Wolf 359. It's terrifying. It's quiet and chilling and horrible. This scene, which is actually a, re a significant part of Picard's character arc from now until first contact, is our first notification past the episode family that Picard's not over it. That he has never actually gotten over the events of Best of Both Worlds. How could he? How is that possible for him to get over that? I, it's one of the things I applaud, actually, is the fact that he didn't get over it. The fact that he still carried those scars, those wounds, years later. Of course he did! God, I've been through a lot less than that, and I still carry scars, mental scars, emotional scars. So the music is now a part of the scene. It helps add, because what we're hearing in that music is not the chilling nature of her threatening him, because she is no threat, and we know that he is a better person than that. No, that music tells us what Picard is feeling as she forces him to relive and remember those horrible, horrible events. This is where things get interesting. See, the problem here is Picard's better than she is. <laughs> Both of them use the exact same tactic on each other, just like I imagine she and her brother used back in the day. That tactic is to hammer the person where it hurts to destroy their credibility and their argument. Neither Picard nor her approach this from, a, from the objective perspective of establishing factual demonstrable evidence. The only time that's ever attempted is when Picard says, we should stop this because this is, this is wrong. That's the closest we ever come to that. Otherwise, it's all about each side effectively attacking the other verbally to weaken them. She hits him with the worst thing he's ever been through in his life. He doesn't falter. He hits her with a quote from her father, and she breaks. This is why he's better than her. Because he took the exact same hit and delivered it in turn, in a much less way, I feel like pointing out. It's not like he's bringing up, you remember when this horrible, terrible thing happened to you? No. He just decides to use her father as his source of strength, to say that her father supports his argument, passively impl passive implication, I forget the proper term for that. But that hits her in a way she can't endure. And this is, again, where I give much praise to Miss Simmons because the way she stands up and is involatile, the way that she is just screeching, how dare you? It's not too much. It would be very easy for an actress to overact that scene, but she doesn't. You could just see the controlled rage pouring through her as, as she is just barely holding on to herself as she spits at him, and then the head of Starfleet Security stands up and walks out on her. Ouch. The hearing's over, everyone leaves, and once again, wonderful praise, wonderful praise to the actress. She sits down with a look of abject shock on her face as everyone just slowly files out of the room. 
I'm sorry, I really like this episode if it's not obvious. But I, as I often do, have a question for you. Picard mentions the vigilance thing at the end and blah, blah, blah. But what I want to ask, what I want to ask is, what do you think was going on in the mind of Admiral Satie? Because near as I can tell, there's two possibilities, roughly. Option one, she really was a McCarthy. She really was, I, I, just, I just realized, sometimes I have to explain that because not, you know, a lot of my viewers aren't in the States or don't study history. There was a gentleman who was named McCarthy who pushed McCarthyism, which was basically um, modern-day witch hunting, actual, you know, hunting down and ruining people's careers uh, by accusing them of being communists or communist supporters uh, back in the, you know, this would have been like, God, 70 years ago now, 60 years, something like that, after World War II. Now, he was exposed as a fraud and a hack, and someone who basically destroyed himself, kind of like she did. And there's deliberate intentional uh, connections between this and the McCarthyism thing. But the point of a McCarthy is it's someone who is basically a bully. Someone who always thinks in that sort of fanatical, zealous terms. I am right, and everyone not fully supporting me is not only wrong, but the enemy. That is a McCarthy, right? So do you think she was that? Or do you think that she basically developed into that without realizing it? That her determination to win, that her objective analysis, so-called, and her debating skills, and the fact that she has continued to try and... She mentioned this earlier in the episode. I have gone from ship to ship. I have no home. I have no family. I have my purpose. That she has allowed this to consume her to the point where all she has is her work. And the fact that she came here and then they just kind of solve it without her, well, obviously there has to be more to it than that. I mean, right? In other words, is she already a horrible person when she steps on this ship? Or do we proceed to watch her go from A to Z? What do you think? I know which perspective I prefer. It would be the latter. Because we do see her be reasonable and intelligent. And we do see her shift bit by bit. There's, well, now no, this and well, and this. And there's so much reasonable about what she does. And it slowly gets less and less reasonable over time. We see the steps throughout this episode as she steps down from A to B to C, etc., etc. That's my take on it. I, but my final piece of evidence is that look of shock on her face. When she loses it at Picard. And that, I think that shock was at herself. Basically, that she had allowed herself to go this far. That she had allowed this to consume her this much. I think it surprised her. But it is, as ever, up to interpretation. And I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on this excellent episode. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you next time. Chukru.